Book Seven, Chapter One of the Boys and Girls Pliny. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Book Seven, The Natural History of Birds, Chapter One, The Ostrich. The history of birds follows next the very largest of which, and indeed almost approaching to the nature of quadrupeds, is the ostrich of Africa or Ethiopia. This bird exceeds in height a man sitting on horseback, and can surpass him in swiftness, as wings have been given to aid it in running. In other respects, ostriches cannot be considered as birds, and do not raise themselves from the earth. They have cloven talons, very similar to the hoof of the stag. With these they fight, and they also employ them in seizing stones for the purpose of throwing at those who pursue them. Footnote. Father Lobo, in his account of Abyssinia, says that when the ostrich is running at great speed, it throws the stones behind with such violence that they would almost seem to be thrown at those in pursuit. An ostrich, Cuvier says, will swallow anything, but it is by no means able to digest everything. He says that he has seen ostriches with the stomach ruptured by nails which they have swallowed, or dreadfully torn by pieces of glass. End of footnote. They have the marvellous property of being able to digest every substance without distinction, but their stupidity is no less remarkable for although the rest of their body is so large they imagine when they have thrust their head and neck into a bush that the whole of the body is concealed their eggs are prized on account of their large size and are employed as vessels for certain purposes while the feathers of the wing and tail are used as ornaments for the crest and helmet of the warrior End of book seven chapter one Book Seven, Chapter Two of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Phoenix. Ethiopia and India, more especially, produce birds of diversified plumage, and such as quite surpass all description. In the front rank of these is the Phoenix. Footnote. All these relations are neither more nor less than so many absurd fables or allegories, but the description given is exactly that of a bird which does exist, the golden pheasant. End of footnote. That famous bird of Arabia, though I am not quite sure that its existence is not all a fable, it is said that there is only one in existence in the whole world, and that that one has not been seen very often. We are told that this bird is of the size of an eagle, and has a brilliant golden plumage around the neck, while the rest of the body is of a purple colour, except the tail which is azure, with long feathers intermingled of a roseate hue. The throat is adorned with a crest, and the head with a tuft of feathers. The first Roman who described this bird, and who has done so with the greatest exactness, was the senator Manilius, so famous for his learning, which he owed to the instructions of no teacher. He tells us that no person has ever seen this bird eat, that in Arabia it is looked upon as sacred to the sun, that it lives five hundred and forty years that when it becomes old it builds a nest of cassia and sprigs of incense which it fills with perfumes and then lays its body down upon them to die that from its bones and marrow there springs at first a sort of small worm which in time changes into a little bird that the first thing that it does is to perform the obsequies of its predecessor and to carry the nest entire to the city of the sun near Pankea and there deposited upon the altar of that divinity. The same Manilius states also that the revolution of the great year, footnote, 532 years, and the footnote, 
is completed with the life of this bird and that then a new cycle comes round again with the same characteristics as the former one in the seasons and the appearance of the stars and he says that this begins about midday of the day on which the sun enters the sign of aries he also tells us that when he wrote to the above effect in the consulship of licinius and cornelius it was the two hundred and fifteenth year of the said revolution cornelius valerianus says that the phoenix took its flight from arabia into egypt in the consulship of plautius and papinius the bird was brought to rome in the censorship of the emperor claudius being the eight hundredth year from the building of the city and it was exposed to public view in the comitium this fact is attested by the public annals but there is no one who supposes that it was a genuine phoenix End of Book 7, Chapter 2book seven chapter three of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by phone the eagle of all the birds with which we are acquainted the eagle is looked upon as the most noble and the most remarkable for its strength there are six different kinds the one called melanatos or black eagle by the greeks and valeria in our language the least in size of them all but the most remarkable for its strength is of a blackish colour it is the only one among all the eagles that feeds its young for the others as we shall presently mention drive them away it is the only one too that has neither cry nor murmur it is an inhabitant of the mountains the second kind is the pigargus white tail an inhabitant of the cities and plains and distinguished by the whiteness of its tail the third is the morphnos it is the second in size and strength and dwells in the vicinity of lakes femonoe who was styled the daughter of apollo has stated that this eagle has teeth but that it has neither voice nor tongue she says also that it is the blackest of all the eagles and has a longer tail than the rest boeus is of the same opinion this eagle has the instinct to break the shell of the tortoise by letting it fall from aloft a circumstance which caused the death of the poet aeschylus an oracle it is said had predicted his death on that day by the fall of a house upon which he took the precaution of trusting himself only under the canopy of the heavens the fourth kind of eagle is the percnoptus black wing with much the appearance of the vulture having remarkably small wings while the rest of the body is larger than the others but it is of a timid and degenerate nature so that even a raven can beat it it is always famishing and ravenous and has a plaintive murmuring cry it is the only one among the eagles that will carry off the dead carcass the others settle on the spot where they have killed their prey the character of this species causes the fifth one to be known by the distinctive name of gnesios as being the genuine eagle and the only one of untainted lineage it is of moderate size of rather reddish colour and rarely to be met with the haliatus or sea eagle is the last and is remarkable for its bright and piercing eye it poises itself aloft and the moment it catches sight of a fish in the sea below pounces headlong upon it and cleaving the water with its breast carries off its prey the eagle which we have mentioned as forming the third species pursues the aquatic birds in the vicinity of standing waters in order to make their escape they plunge into the water every now and then until at length they are overtaken by lassitude and sleep upon which the eagle immediately seizes them the contest that takes place is really a sight worthy to be seen the bird makes for the shore to seek a refuge especially if there should happen to be a bed of reeds there while in the meantime the eagle endeavours to drive it away with repeated blows of its wings 
and tumbles into the water in its attempts to seize it while it is standing on the shore its shadow is seen by the bird which immediately dives beneath and then making its way in an opposite direction emerges at some point at which it thinks it is the least likely to be looked for this is the reason why these birds swim in flocks for when in large numbers they are in no danger from the enemy as by dashing up the spray with their wings they blind him again it often happens that the eagle is not able to carry the bird aloft on account of its weight and in consequence they both of them sink together this and the haliatus beat their young ones while in an unfledged state with their wings and force them from time to time to look steadily upon the rays of the sun and if the parent sees either of them wink or even its eye water it throws it headlong out of the nest as being spurious and degenerate but rears the one whose gaze remains fixed and steady eagles build among rocks and trees they lay three eggs and generally hatch but two young ones though occasionally as many as three have been seen being weary of the trouble of rearing both they drive one of them from the nest for just at this time the providential foresight of nature has denied them a sufficiency of food to save the young of all other animals from becoming their prey during this period their talons become reversed and their feathers grow white from continued hunger so that it is not to be wondered at that they take a dislike to their young the ossifrage however a kindred species takes charge of the young ones thus rejected and rears them with its own but the parent bird still pursues them with hostility even when grown up and drives them away as being its rivals in rapine under any circumstances one pair of eagles requires a very considerable space of ground to forage over in order to find sufficient sustenance for which reason they mark out by boundaries their respective allotments they do not immediately carry off their prey but first deposit it on the ground test its weight and then fly away with it they die not of old age nor yet of sickness or of hunger but the upper part of the beak grows to such an extent and becomes so curved that they are unable to open it they take the wing and begin upon the labours of the chase at midday sitting in idleness during the hours of the morning until such time as the places of public resort are filled with people it is said that this is the only bird that has never been killed by lightning hence usage has pronounced it to be the armour-bearer of jove caius marius in his second consulship assigned the eagle exclusively to the roman legions before that period it had only held the first rank over four others the wolf the minotaur the horse and the wild boar each of which preceded a single division some few years before his time it had begun to be the custom to carry only the eagle into battle the other standards being left behind in camp but marius abolished the rest of them entirely since then it has been remarked that hardly ever has a roman legion encamped for the winter without a pair of eagles making their appearance at the spot the first two species of eagle not only prey upon the whole of the smaller quadrupeds but will attack even deer rolling in the dust the eagle covers its body all over with it then perching on the antlers of the animal shakes the dust into its eyes while at the same time it beats it on the head with its wings until the creature at last precipitates itself down the rocks nor is this one enemy sufficient for it it has still more terrible combats with the dragon and the issue is much more doubtful although the battle is fought in the air the dragon seeks the eggs of the eagle with a mischievous avidity while the eagle in return carries it off whenever it happens to see it 
Upon these occasions the dragon coils itself about the wings of the bird in multiplied folds, until at last they fall to the earth together. There is a very famous story about an eagle at the city of Sestos. Having been reared by a little girl, it used to testify its gratitude for her kindness, first by bringing her birds, and in due time various other kinds of prey. At last she died, upon which the bird threw itself on the lighted pile, and was consumed with her body. In memory of this event, the inhabitants raised upon the spot what they called a heroic monument, in honour of Jupiter and the damsel, the eagle being a bird consecrated to that divinity. End of Book 7, Chapter 3「Of the vultures, the black ones are the strongest. No person has yet found a vulture's nest, so that some have thought, though erroneously, that these birds come from the opposite hemisphere. The fact is that they build their nest upon the very highest rocks. Their young ones are often to be seen, generally two in number. Ambrisius, the most skilful among the Araspices of our time, says that the vulture lays three eggs, and that with one of these it purifies the others and its nest, and then throws it away. He states also that they hover about for three days, over the spot where carcasses are about to be found. We find no less than sixteen kinds of hawks mentioned. Among these are the agitas, which is lame of one leg, and is looked upon as the most favourable omen for the augurs on the occasion of a marriage, or in matters connected with property in the shape of cattle. There is a Roman family that has taken its surname from the species known as the buteo, from the circumstance of this bird having given a favourable omen by settling upon the ship of one of them when he held a command. The Greeks call one kind Epileus, the only one that is seen at all seasons of the year, the others taking their departure in the winter. The various kinds are distinguished by the avidity and the various methods with which they seize their prey for while some will pounce on a bird only on the ground, others will seize it only while hovering round the trees, others again while it is perched aloft, and others while it is flying in mid-air. Pigeons, on seeing them, are aware of the nature of the danger to which they are exposed, and either settle on the ground or else fly upwards, instinctively protecting themselves by taking due precautions against their natural propensities. In a part of Thrace which lies above Amphipolis, men and hawks go in pursuit of prey, in a sort of partnership. For while the men drive the birds from out of the woods and the reed beds, the hawks bring them down as they fly, and after they have taken the game, the fowlers share it with them. It has been said that when sent aloft they will pick out the birds that are wanted, and that when the opportune moment for taking them has come, they invite the fowler to seize the opportunity by their cries and their peculiar mode of flying. Hawks will not eat the heart of a bird. The nighthawk is called Sibindus. It is rarely found, even in the woods, and in the daytime its sight is not good. It wages war to the death with the eagle, and they are often to be found clasped in each other's talons. The cuckoo seems to be but another form of the hawk. Footnote. This erroneous notion is still entertained by the French peasantry. End of footnote. Which at a certain season of the year changes its shape it being the fact that during this period no other hawks are to be seen, except perhaps for a few days. The cuckoo itself is only seen for a short period in the summer, and does not make its appearance after. It is the only one among the hawks that has not hooked talons. 
neither is it like the rest of them in the head or in any other respect except the colour while in the beak it bears a stronger resemblance to the pigeon in addition to this it is devoured by the hawk if they chance any time to meet this being the only one among the whole race of birds that is preyed upon by those of its own kind it changes its voice also with its appearance comes out in the spring and goes into retirement at the rising of the dog star it always lays its eggs in the nest of another bird mostly a single egg a thing that is the case with no other bird sometimes however but very rarely it is known to lay two it is supposed that the reason for its thus substituting its young ones is the fact that it is aware how greatly it is hated by all the other birds footnote cuvier remarks that this is not a very good reason but we have not yet been able to find a better End of footnote. for even the very smallest of them will attack it so thinking that its own race will stand no chance of being perpetuated unless it contrives to deceive them it builds no nest of its own and besides it is a very timid animal in the meantime the female bird sitting on her nest is rearing a supposititious and spurious progeny while the young cuckoo which is naturally craving and greedy snatches away all the food from the other young ones and by so doing grows plump and sleek and quite gains the affections of his foster-mother who takes a great pleasure in his fine appearance and is quite surprised that she has become the mother of so handsome an offspring in comparison with him she discards her own young as so many strangers until at last when the young cuckoo is now able to take the wing he finishes by devouring her footnote cuvier denies this story but says that when the foster mother is a very small bird the young cuckoo will take the whole of her head in his beak when receiving food End of footnote. for sweetness of the flesh there is not a bird in existence to be compared to the cuckoo at this season the kite which belongs to the same genus is distinguished from the rest of the hawks by its larger size it has been remarked of this bird extremely ravenous as it is and always craving that it has never been known to seize any food either from among funeral oblations or from the altar of jupiter at olympia nor does it ever seize any of the consecrated viands from the hands of those who are carrying them except where some misfortune is presaged for the town that is offering the sacrifice these birds seem to have taught man the art of steering from the motion of the tail nature pointing out by their movements in the air the method required for navigating the deep kites also disappear during the winter months but do not take their departure before the swallow End of book seven, chapter four. Book Seven, Chapter Five of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. The Crow, the Raven, and the Owl. The crow, among other kinds of food, feeds upon nuts. If these prove too hard for his beak to break, the crow flies to a great height and then lets them fall again and again upon the stones and tiles beneath until at last the shell is cracked and the bird is able to open them the crow is a bird of very ill-omened garrulity though it has been highly praised by some it is observed that from the rising of the constellation arcturus until the arrival of the swallow it is rarely to be seen about the sacred groves and temples of minerva and in athens not at all it is the only bird that continues to feed its young for some time after they have begun to fly the crow is most inauspicious at the time of incubation or in other words just after the summer solstice all the other birds of the same kind like the raven for example drive their young ones from their nest and compel them to fly 
in small hamlets there are never more than two pairs to be found and in the neighbourhood of cranon in thessaly never more than one the parents always quitting the spot to give place to their offspring ravens are the only birds that seem to have any comprehension of the meaning of their auspices for when the guests of medus were assassinated they all took their departure from peloponnesus and the region of attica they are of the very worst omen when they swallow their voice as if they were being choked the birds of the night the owlet the horned owl and the screech owl have crooked talons and the sight of all is defective in the daytime the horned owl is especially funereal and is greatly abhorred in all auspices of public nature it inhibits desolate spots of a frightful and inaccessible nature the monster of the night its voice is heard not with any tuneful note but emitting a sort of shriek it is therefore looked upon as a direful omen to see it in a city i know however for a fact that it is not portentous of evil when it settles on the top of a private house it cannot fly whither it wishes in a straight line but is always carried forward by a sidelong movement a horned owl entered the very sanctuary of the capital in the consulship of Popelius and pedanius in consequence of which rome was purified on the nones of march in that year an inauspicious bird also is that known as the incendiary on account of which we find in the annals the city has had to be repeatedly purified as for instance in the consulship of cassius and marius in which year also it was purified in consequence of a horned owl being seen what kind of bird this incendiary was we do not find stated nor is it known by tradition footnote our jackdaw probably the corvus graculus it has been said that in its admiration of shining objects it will take up a burning coal a trick which has before now caused conflagrations End of footnote. some persons explain the term this way they say that the name incendiary was applied to every bird that was seen carrying a burning coal from the pyre or altar the owlet shows considerable shrewdness in its engagement with other birds for when surrounded by too great a number it throws itself on its back resists with its feet and rolling up its body into a mass defends itself with the beak and talons until the hawk attracted by a certain natural affinity comes to its assistance and takes its share in the combat nigidius says that the owlet has nine different notes End of book seven chapter five book seven chapter six of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone the woodpecker of mars there are some small birds which have hooked talons the woodpecker for example surnamed of mars of considerable importance in the auspices to this kind belong the birds which make holes in trees and climb stealthily up them like cats mounting with the head upwards they tap against the bark and learn by the sound whether or not their food lies beneath they are the only birds that hatch their young in the hollows of trees it is a common belief that if a shepherd drives a wedge into their holes they apply a certain kind of herb and it immediately falls out trabius informs us that if a nail or wedge is driven with ever so much force into a tree in which these birds have made their nest it will instantly fly out the tree making a loud cracking noise the moment that the bird has lighted upon the nail or wedge these birds have held the first rank in auguries in latium since the time of the king who has given them their name footnote picus the son of saturn king of latium he was skilled in augury and was said to have been changed into a woodpecker End of footnote. 
one of the presages that was given by them i cannot pass over in silence a woodpecker came and lighted upon the head of alias tubero the city praetor when sitting on his tribunal dispensing justice in the forum and showed such tameness as to allow itself to be taken with the hand upon which the augurs declared that if it was let go the state was menaced with danger but if killed disaster would befall the praetor in an instant he tore the bird to pieces and before long the omen was fulfilled footnote valerius maximus says that seventeen members of this family fell at the battle of cannae End of footnote. many birds of this kind feed also on acorns and fruit but only those which are not carnivorous with the exception of the kite though when it feeds on anything but flesh it is a bird of ill omen the birds which have hooked talons are never gregarious each one seeks its prey by itself they nearly all of them soar to great height with the exception of the birds of the night and more especially those of larger size they all have large wings and a small body they walk with difficulty and rarely settle upon stones being prevented from doing so by the curved shape of their talons End of Book 7, Chapter 6book seven chapter seven of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone the peacock and the rooster we shall now speak of the second class of birds employed in augury which is divided into two kinds those which give omens by their note and those which afford presages by their flight the variation of the note in the one and the relative size in the other constitute the differences between them the peacock shall have precedence of all the rest as much for its singular beauty as its superior instinct and the vanity it displays when it hears itself praised this bird spreads out its gorgeous colours especially if the sun happens to be shining at the time because then they are seen in all their radiance and to better advantage at the same time spreading out its tail in the form of a shell it throws the reflection upon the other feathers which shine all the more brilliantly when a shadow is cast upon them then at another moment it will contract all the eyes depicted upon its feathers in a single mass manifesting great delight in having them admired by the spectator the peacock loses its tail every year at the fall of the leaf and the new one shoots forth in its place at the flower season between these periods the bird is abashed and moping and seeks retired spots the peacock lives twenty-five years and begins to show its colours in the third by some authors it is stated that this bird is not only a vain creature but of a spiteful disposition just as they attribute bashfulness to the goose the characteristics however which they have thus ascribed to these birds appear to me to be utterly unfounded the orator hortensius was the first roman who had peacocks killed for the table it was on the occasion of the banquet given by him on his inauguration in the college of the priesthood marcus aufidius lurco was the first who taught the art of fattening them about the time of the last war with the pirates from this source of profit he acquired an income of sixty thousand sesterces next after the peacock the animal that acts as a watchman by night and which nature has produced for the purpose of arousing mortals to their labours and dispelling their slumbers shows itself most actuated by feelings of vanity the cock knows how to distinguish the stars and mark the different periods of the day every three hours by his note these animals go to roost with the setting of the sun and at the fourth watch of the camp recall man to his cares and toils they do not allow the rising of the sun to creep upon us unawares but by their note proclaim the coming day 
and they prelude their crowing by clapping their sides with their wings. They exercise a rigorous sway over the other birds of their kind, and in every place where they are kept, hold the supreme command. This, however, is only obtained after repeated battles among themselves, as they are well aware that they have weapons on their legs, produced for that very purpose, and the contest often ends in the death of both the combatants at the same moment. If, on the other hand, one of them obtains the mastery, he instantly by his note proclaims himself the conqueror, and testifies by his crowing that he has been victorious, while his conquered opponent silently slinks away, and, though with a very bad grace, submits to servitude. And with equal pride does the throng of the poultry yard strut along, with head uplifted and crest erect. These, too, are the only ones among the winged race that repeatedly look up to the heavens, with the tail raised aloft, which in its drooping shape resembles that of a sickle, and these birds inspire terror even in the lion, the most courageous of all animals. Some of these birds, known as game cocks, are reared for nothing but warfare and perpetual combats, and have even shed a luster thereby on their native places, Rhodes and Tanagra. The next rank is considered to belong to those of Milos and Calchis. Hence it is with very good reason that the consular purple of Rome pays these birds such singular honours. From the feeding of these creatures, the omens by fowls are derived. They regulate day by day the movements of our magistrates, and open or shut to them their own houses, as the case may be. They give an impulse to the fasces of the Roman magistracy, or withhold them. They command battles or forbid them, and furnish auspices for victories to be gained in every part of the world. It is these that hold supreme rule over those who are themselves the ruler of the earth, and whose entrails and fibres are as pleasing to the gods as the first spoils of victory. Their note, when heard at an unusual hour or in the evening, has also its peculiar presages, for on one occasion, by crowing the whole night through for several nights, they presaged to the Bœtians that famous victory which they gained over the Lacedaemonians, such, in fact, being the interpretation that was put upon it by way of prognostic, as this bird, when conquered, is never known to crow. End of Book 7, Chapter 7Book Seven, Chapter Eight of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. The Goose. The Goose also keeps a vigilant guard, a fact which is well attested by the defence of the Capitol, at a moment when, by the silence of the dogs, the Commonwealth had been betrayed for which reason the censors always, as their first duty, attend to the farming out of the feeding of the sacred geese. One might almost be tempted to think that these creatures have an appreciation of wisdom, for it is said that one of them was the constant companion of the philosopher Lachidas, and would never leave him, either in public or when at the bath, by night or by day. Our people, however, are more wise, for they esteem the goose only for the excellence of its liver. When they are crammed, this grows to a very large size, and on being taken from the animal, is made still larger by being soaked in honeyed milk. It is matter of debate who first discovered so great a delicacy, whether it was Scipio Metellus, a man of consular dignity, or Marcus Seius, a contemporary of his, and a Roman of equestrian rank. But there is no dispute that it was Messalinus Cotta, the son of the orator Messala, who first discovered the art of roasting the webbed feet of the goose, and of cooking them in a ragout with cock's combs. A second income is derived from the feathers of the white goose. In some places, this animal is plucked twice a year, upon which the feathers quickly grow again. 
those are the softest which lie nearest to the body and those that come from germany are the most esteemed the geese there are white but of small size the price paid for their feathers is five denarii per pound it is from this fruitful source that we have repeated charges brought against the commanders of our auxiliaries who are in the habit of detaching whole cohorts from the posts where they ought to be on guard in pursuit of these birds indeed we have come to such a pitch of effeminacy that nowadays not even the men can think of lying down without the aid of the goose's feathers by way of pillow End of Book Seven, Chapter Eight. Book Seven, Chapter Nine of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Cranes. The tracts over which the cranes travel must be immense if we only consider that they come all the way from the eastern sea these birds agree by common consent at what moment they shall set out fly aloft to look out afar select a leader for them to follow and have sentinels duly posted in the rear which relieve each other by turns utter loud cries and with their voice keep the whole flight in proper array during the night they place sentinels on guard each of whom holds a little stone in his claw if the bird should happen to fall asleep the claw becomes relaxed and the stone falls to the ground and so convicts it of neglect the rest sleep in the meanwhile with the head beneath the wing standing first on one leg and then on the other the leader looks out with neck erect and gives warning when required these birds when tamed are very frolicsome and even when alone will describe a sort of circle as they move along with their clumsy gait it is a well-known fact that these birds when about to fly over the euxine first of all repair to the narrowest part of it that lies between the two promontories of creomitopon and carambis and then ballast themselves with coarse sand when they have arrived midway in the passage they throw away the stones from out of their claws and as soon as they reach the mainland discharge the sand from the throat cornelius nepos who died in the reign of the late emperor augustus after stating that thrushes had been fattened for the first time shortly before that period has added that storks were more esteemed as food than cranes but at the present day this last bird is one of those that are held in the very highest esteem while no one will touch the other End of book seven chapter nine book seven chapter ten of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone storks and swans up to the present time it has not been ascertained from what place the storks come or whither they go when they leave us there can be no doubt but that like the cranes they come from a very great distance the cranes being our winter the storks our summer guests when about to take their departure the storks assemble at a stated place and are particularly careful that all shall attend so that not one of their kind may be left behind with the exception of such as may be in captivity or tamed and then on a certain day they set out as though they were by some law directed to do so no one has ever yet seen a flight of cranes taking their departure although they have been often observed preparing to depart and in the same way too we never see them arrive both their departure and their arrival take place in the night in some of the vast plains of asia they assemble together keep up a gabbling noise and tear to pieces the one that happens to arrive the last after which they take their departure after the middle of august they are never by any accident to be seen there 
some writers assure us that the stork has no tongue so highly are they esteemed for their utility in destroying serpents that in thessaly it was a capital crime for any one to kill a stork and by the laws the same penalty was inflicted for it as for homicide geese and swans travel in a similar manner but are seen to take their flight the flocks forming a point like a harrow much after the manner of our liburnian beaked galleys move along with great impetus being thus able to cleave the air more easily than if they presented to it a broad front the flight gradually enlarges in the rear in the form of a wedge presenting a vast surface to the breeze as it impels them onward those that follow place their necks on those that go before while the leading birds as they become weary fall to the rear storks return to their former nests and the young in their turn support their parents when old it is stated that at the moment of the swan's death it gives utterance to a mournful song but this is an error in my opinion footnote m Mauduy, in a learned discussion many pages in length satisfactorily shows that this is not entirely fabulous but that the wild swan of the northern climates really is possessed of a tuneful note or cadence of course the statement that it only sings just before its death must be rejected as fabulous End of footnote. these birds will eat the flesh of one another End of book seven chapter ten book seven chapter eleven of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone foreign birds which visit us having spoken of the emigration of these birds over sea and land i cannot allow myself to defer mentioning some other birds of smaller size which have the same natural instinct although in the case of those which i have already mentioned their very size and strength would almost seem to invite them to such habits the quail which always arrives among us before the crane is a small bird which more commonly keeps to the ground than flies aloft these birds fly in a similar manner to those i have already spoken of and not without considerable danger to mariners when they come near the surface of the earth for it often happens that they settle on the sails of a ship and that too always in the night in such numbers that the vessel often sinks these birds pursue their course along a tract of country with certain resting places when the south wind is blowing they will not fly as that wind is always humid and apt to weigh them down the body being so light and their strength so very limited and frequently we hear them making a murmuring noise as they fly it being extorted from them by fatigue for this reason they take to flight when the north wind is blowing having the ortigometra for their leader footnote the mother of quails frederick the second in his work the art de venandi calls the rallus or rail the leader of the quails and the footnote the first of them that approaches the earth is generally snapped up by the hawk when they are about to return from these parts they always invite other birds to join their company and the glottis otis and kikramus yielding to their persuasions take their departure along with them the glottis protrudes a tongue of remarkable length from which circumstance it derives its name at first it is quite pleased with the journey and sets out with the greatest ardour but very soon when it begins to feel the fatigues of the flight it is overtaken by regret while at the same time it is equally as loath to return alone as to accompany the others its travels never last more than a single day for at the very first resting place they come to it deserts here too it finds other birds which have been left behind in a similar manner in the preceding year 
The same takes place with other birds day after day. The kikramus is much more persevering, and is in such a hurry to arrive at the land which is its destination, that it arouses the quails in the night, and reminds them that they ought to be on the road. The otis is a smaller bird than the horned owl, though larger than the owlet. It has feathers projecting like ears, which gives it its name. Some person call it in the Latin language the acio. In general, it is a bird fond of mimicking, a great parasite, and in some measure a dancer as well. Like the owlet, it is taken without any difficulty. For while one person occupies its attention, another goes behind and catches it. If the wind, by its contrary blasts, should begin to prevent the onward progress of the flight, the birds immediately take up small stones, or else fill their throats with sand, and so contrive to ballast themselves as they fly. The seeds of a certain venomous plant are most highly esteemed by the quails as food. Footnote, either hemlock or hellebore. End of footnote. For which reason they have been banished from our tables, and a great repugnance is manifested to eating their flesh on account of the epilepsy to which alone of all animals, with the exception of man, the quail is subject. End of book seven, chapter eleven. Book Seven, Chapter Twelve of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Swallows. The swallow, the only bird that is carnivorous among those which have not hooked talons, takes its departure also during the winter months, but it goes only to neighboring countries seeking sunny retreats there on the mountain sides. Sometimes they have been found in such spots, bare and quite unfledged. This bird, it is said, will not enter a house in Thebes, because that city has been captured so frequently. Nor will it approach the country of Bizier, on account of the crimes committed there by Terus. Cassina, a member of the equestrian order, and the owner of several chariots, used to have swallows caught, and then carried them with him to Rome. Upon gaining a victory, he would send the news by them to his friends, for after staining them the colour of the party that had gained the day, he would let them go, immediately upon which they would make their way to the nests they had previously occupied. Fabius Pictor also relates, in his annals, that when a Roman garrison was being besieged by the Ligurians, a swallow which had been taken from its young ones was brought to him, in order that he might give them notice, by the number of knots on a string tied to its leg, on what day succour would arrive, and a sortie might be made with advantage. End of Book 7 Chapter 12 Book Seven, Chapter Thirteen of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Birds which take their departure from us in winter. In a similar manner, also, the blackbird, the thrush, and the starling take their departure to neighboring countries, but they do not lose their feathers nor conceal themselves, as they are often to be seen in places where they seek their food during the winter. Hence it is that in winter, more especially, the thrush is so often to be seen in Germany. It is, however, a well-ascertained fact that the turtle-dove conceals itself and loses its feathers. The ring-dove also takes its departure, yet it is a matter of doubt whither they go. A peculiarity of the starling is to fly in troops, as it were, and then to wheel round in a globular mass like a ball, the central troop acting as a pivot for the rest. Swallows are the only birds that have a sinuous flight of remarkable velocity. 
so that they are not exposed to the attacks of other birds of prey. These are the only birds that take their food solely on the wing. The time during which birds show themselves differs very considerably. Some, like the pigeon, remain with us all the year round, some for six months, such as the swallow, and some again for three months only, as the thrush, the turtle dove, and those which take their departure the moment they have reared their young, like the whitwall and the hoopoe. There are some authors who say that every year certain birds fly from Ethiopia to Ilium, and have a combat at the tomb of Memnon there, from which circumstance they have received from them the name of Memnonites, or birds of Memnon. Cremutius states it also as a fact, ascertained by himself, that they do the same every fifth year in Ethiopia, around the palace of Memnon. In a similar manner, the birds called Meleagrides fight in Boeotia. They are a species of African poultry, having a hump on the back covered with a mottled plumage. These are the latest among the foreign birds that have been received at our tables, on account of their disagreeable smell. The tomb, however, of Meleager has rendered them famous. Those birds are called Seleucides, which are sent by Jupiter at the prayers offered up to him by the inhabitants of Mount Cassius, when the locusts are ravaging their crops of corn. Whence they come, or whither they go, has never yet been ascertained, as in fact they are never to be seen but when the people stand in need of their aid. The Egyptians also invoke their ibis against the incursion of serpents, and the people of Elis, their god Myagros, the hunter of flies, when the vast multitudes of flies are bringing pestilence among them. The flies die immediately after the propitiary sacrifice has been made to this god. Rhodes possesses no eagles. In Italy, beyond the Padus, there is, near the Alps, a lake known by the name of Lerius, beautifully situated amid a country covered with shrubs, and yet this lake is never visited by storks, nor are they ever known to come within eight miles of it, while in the neighboring territory of the Insubris there are immense flocks of magpies and jackdaws, the only bird that is guilty of stealing gold and silver, a very singular propensity. It is said that in the territory of Tarentum, the woodpecker of Mars is never found. It is only lately, and that very rarely, that various kinds of pies have begun to be seen in the districts that lie between the Apennines and the city. These birds are remarkable for the length of the tail and for the peculiarity of becoming bold every year at the time of sowing rape. The partridge does not fly beyond the frontiers of Boeotia into Attica, nor does any bird in the island in the Black Sea in which Achilles was buried enter the temple there consecrated to him. In the territory of Fidene, in the vicinity of the city, the storks have no young, nor do they build nests, but vast numbers of ring doves arrive from beyond sea every year in the district of Volaterre. At Rome, neither highs nor dogs ever enter the temple of Hercules in the cattle market. There are numerous other instances of a similar nature in reference to all kinds of animals, which from time to time I feel myself prompted by prudent considerations to omit lest I should only weary the reader. There is another remarkable fact, too, relative to the birds which give omens by their note. They generally change their colour and voice at a certain season of the year, and suddenly become quite altered in appearance, a thing that among the larger birds happens with the crane only, which grows black in its old age. From black, the blackbird changes to a reddish colour, sings in summer, chatters in winter, and about the summer solstice loses its voice. When a year old, the beak also assumes the appearance of ivory, but only in the case of the male. 
In summer, the thrush is mottled about the neck, but in winter it becomes one uniform color all over. End of Book 7, Chapter 13book seven chapter fourteen of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone the nightingale the song of the nightingale is to be heard without intermission for fifteen days and nights continuously when the foliage is thickening as it bursts from the bud a bird which deserves our admiration in no slight degree. First of all, what a powerful voice it has in so small a body! Its note, how long, and how well sustained! And then, too, it is the only bird the notes of which are modulated in accordance with the strict rules of musical science. At one moment, as it sustains its breath, it will prolong its note, and then at another will vary it with different inflections then again it will break into distinct chirrups or pour forth an endless series of roulades then it will warble to itself while taking breath or disguise its voice in an instant while sometimes again it will twitter to itself now with a full note now with a grave now again sharp now with a broken note and now with a prolonged one. Sometimes, when it thinks fit, it will break out into quavers, and will run through, in succession, alto, tenor, and bass. In a word, in so tiny a throat is to be found all the melody that the ingenuity of man has ever discovered through the medium of the invention of the most exquisite flute so that there can be no doubt it was an infallible presage of his future sweetness as a poet when one of these creatures perched and sang on the infant lips of the poet's Desicorus. no doubt there is a remarkable degree of art in its performances for every individual has a number of notes peculiar to itself they do not all of them have the same but each certain melodies of its own they vie with one another and the spirit with which they contend is evident to all often the one that is vanquished dies in the contest preferring to yield its life rather than its song the younger birds are listening in the meantime and receive the lesson in song from which they are to profit the learner hearkens with the greatest attention and repeats what it has heard and then they are silent by turns this is understood to be the correction of an error on the part of the scholar and a sort of reproof as it were on the part of the teacher nightingales bring as high a price as slaves and sometimes more than used formerly to be paid for a man in a suit of armour i know that on one occasion six thousand sesterces two hundred and fifty dollars was paid for a nightingale a white one it is true a thing that is hardly ever to be seen for a present to agrippina the wife of the emperor claudius a nightingale has been often seen that will sing at command and take alternate parts with the music that accompanies it men too have been found who could imitate its note with such exactness that it would be impossible to tell the difference by merely putting water in a reed held crosswise and then blowing into it a languette being first inserted for the purpose of breaking the sound and rendering it more shrill but these modulations so clever and so artistic begin gradually to cease at the end of the fifteen days not that you can say however that the bird is either fatigued or tired of singing but as the heat increases its voice becomes altogether changed and possesses no longer either modulation or variety of note its colour too becomes changed and at last throughout the winter it totally disappears the tongue of the nightingale is not pointed at the tip 
as in other birds it lays at the beginning of the spring six eggs at the most end of book seven chapter fourteen book seven chapter fifteen of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone the halcyons the halcyon days that are favorable to navigation this bird is a little larger than a sparrow and the greater part of its body is of an azure blue color with a slight intermixture of white and purple in some of the larger feathers while the neck is long and slender there is one kind that is remarkable for its larger size and its note the smaller ones are heard singing in the reed beds it is a thing of very rare occurrence to see a halcyon and then it is only about the time of the setting of the virgilie and the summer and winter solstices when one is sometimes to be seen to hover about a ship and then immediately disappear they hatch their young at the time of the winter solstice from which circumstance those days are known as the halcyon days during this period the sea is calm and navigable the sicilian sea in particular they make their nest during the seven days before the winter solstice and sit the same number of days after their nests are truly wonderful they are of the shape of a bowl slightly elongated have a very narrow mouth and bear a strong resemblance to a large sponge footnote this bird in reality builds no nest but lays its eggs in holes on the water side the objects taken for its nest are a zoophyte called halcyonium by linnaeus and similar in shape to a nest End of footnote. it is impossible to cut them asunder with iron and they are only to be broken with a strong blow upon which they separate just like foam of the sea when dried up it has never yet been discovered of what material they are made some persons think that they are formed of sharp fish bones as it is on fish that these birds live they enter rivers also their eggs are five in number the sea mew builds its nest in rocks and the diver in trees as well end of book seven chapter fifteen book seven chapter sixteen of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. The instinctive cleverness displayed by birds in the construction of their nests. The form of the nest built by the halcyon reminds me also of the instinctive cleverness displayed by other birds, and in no respect is the ingenuity of birds more deserving of our admiration the swallow builds its nest of mud and strengthens it with straws if mud happens to fail it soaks itself with a quantity of water which it then shakes off from its feathers into the dust it lines the inside of the nest with soft feathers and wool to keep the eggs warm and in order that the nest may not be hard and rough to its young when hatched it divides the food among its offspring with the most rigid justice giving it first to one and then to another there is a kind of swallow that frequents the fields and the country its nest is of a different shape though of the same materials but it rarely builds it against houses the nest has its mouth turned straight upwards and the entrance to it is long and narrow while the body is very capacious it is quite wonderful what skill is displayed in the formation of it for the purpose of concealing the young ones and of presenting a soft surface for them to lie upon at the heracleotic mouth of the nile in egypt the swallows present an insuperable obstacle to the inroads of that river in the embankment which is formed by their nests in one continuous line nearly a stadium in length 
a thing that could not possibly have been effected by the agency of man in egypt near the city of koptos there is an island sacred to isis in the early days of spring the swallows strengthen the angular corner of this island with chaff and straw thus fortifying it in order that the river may not sweep it away this work they persevere in for three days and nights together with such unremitting labour that many of them die with their exertions a third kind of swallow makes holes in the banks of rivers to serve for its nest the young of these birds reduced to ashes are a good specific against mortal maladies of the throat and tend to cure many other diseases of the human body these birds do not build nests and they take care to migrate a good many days before if it so happens that the rise of the river is about to reach their holes End of Book 7, Chapter 16Book Seven, Chapter Seventeen of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. The Acanthillus and the Partridge, belonging to the genus of birds known as the Vigiparidae, there is one whose nest is formed of dried moss. Footnote: Not moss, Cuvier says but blades of grass and the silken fibres of the poplar and other aquatic trees and, the footnote. and is in shape so exactly like a ball that it is impossible to discover the mouth of it the bird known as the acanthillus makes its nest of a similar shape and interweaves it with pieces of flax the nest of one of the woodpeckers very much like a cup in shape is suspended by a twig from the end of the branch of a tree so that no quadruped may be able to reach it it is strongly asserted that the whitwall sleeps suspended by its feet because it fancies that by doing so it is in greater safety in a spirit of foresight they select projecting branches of trees that are sufficiently strong for the purpose of supporting their nests and then arch them over to protect them from the rain or else shield them by means of the thickness of the foliage in arabia there is a bird known as the cinnamolgus which builds its nest with sprigs of cinnamon the natives knock the nest down with arrows loaded with lead in order to sell them in scythia there is a bird the size of the otis which produces two young ones always in a hare's skin suspended from the top branches of a tree pies when they have observed a person steadily gazing at their nest will immediately remove their eggs to another place this is accomplished in a truly wonderful manner by such birds as have not toes adapted for holding and removing their eggs they lay a twig upon two eggs and then solder them to it by means of a glutinous matter secreted from their body after which they pass their neck between the eggs and so forming an equipoise convey them to another place no less shrewdness is displayed by those birds which make their nests upon the ground because from the extreme weight of their body they are unable to fly aloft there is a bird known as the merops which feeds its parent in their retreat the colour of the plumage is pale on the inside and azure without while it is of a somewhat reddish hue at the extremity of the wings this bird builds its nest in a hole which it digs to the depth of six feet partridges fortify their retreat so well with thorns and shrubs that it is effectually protected against beasts of prey they make a soft bed for their eggs by burying them in the dust but do not hatch them where they are laid that no suspicion may arise from the fact of their being seen repeatedly about the same spot they carry them away to some other place the females also conceal themselves in order that they may not be delayed in the process of incubation as the males are apt to break the eggs 
the males often fall to fighting among themselves like game cocks and through this very pugnacity these birds are often taken as the leader of the whole covey frequently advances to fight with the decoy bird of the fowler as soon as he is taken another and then another will advance all of which are caught in their turn these birds are often carried away by such frantic madness that they will settle being quite blinded by fear upon the very head of the fowler if he happens to move in the direction of the nest the female bird that is sitting will run and throw herself before his feet pretending to be wounded or weak then suddenly running or flying for a short distance before him will fall down as though she had a wing broken just as he is about to catch her she will then take another fly and so keep baffling him in his hopes until she has led him to a considerable distance from her nest as soon as she is rid of her fears and free from all maternal disquietude she will throw herself on her back in some furrow and seizing a clod of earth with her claws cover herself all over it is supposed that the life of the partridge extends to sixteen years end of book seven chapter seventeen book seven chapter eighteen of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone pigeons the pigeon will never desert its nest unless it is either widower or widow they manifest a great degree of affection for their offspring when the female is sitting the male renders her every attention that can in any way tend to her solace and comfort the first thing that they do is to eject from the throat some saltish earth which they have digested into the mouths of the young ones in order to prepare them in due time to receive their nutriment it is a peculiarity of the pigeon and of the turtle dove not to throw back the neck when drinking but to take in the water at a long draught just as beasts of burden do we read in some authors that the ring dove lives as long as thirty years and sometimes forty without any other inconvenience than the extreme length of the claws which with them is the chief mark of old age they can be cut however without any danger the voice of all these birds is similar being composed of three notes succeeded by a mournful noise at the end in winter they are silent recovering their voice with coming of the spring Nigidius expresses the opinion that the ring dove will abandon the place if she hears her name mentioned under the roof where she is sitting on her eggs they hatch their young at the summer solstice pigeons and turtle doves live eight years the sparrow on the other hand is short-lived in the extreme pigeons appear to have a certain appreciation of glory they are well aware of the colours of their plumage and the various shades which it presents and even in their very mode of flying they court our applause as they cleave the air in every direction through this spirit of ostentation they are handed over fast bound as it were to the hawk for from the flapping of their wings their long feathers become twisted and disordered while if they can fly without any impediment they are far swifter in their movements than the hawk the robber lurking amid the dense foliage keeps on the lookout for them and seizes them at the very moment that they are indulging their vain-glorious self-complaisance for this reason it is necessary to keep along with the pigeons the bird that is known as the tininculus as it protects them and by its natural superiority scares away the hawk the hawk will vanish at the very sight of it or the instant it hears its voice pigeons have a special regard for this bird and it is said if one of these birds is buried at each of the four corners of the pigeon-house 
in pots that have been newly glazed, the pigeons will not change their abode, a result which has been obtained by some keepers of pigeons, by cutting a joint of their wings with an instrument of gold. For if any other were used, the wounds would be attended with danger. The pigeon in general may be looked upon as a bird fond of change. They have the art, too, among themselves, of gaining one another over, and so proselyting companions. We frequently find them returning to the cot attended by others which they have enticed away. Pigeons have frequently acted as messengers in affairs of importance. During the siege of Mutina, Decimus Brutus, who was in the town, sent despatches to the camp of the consuls fastened to pigeons' feet. Of what use to Antony, then, were his entrenchments, and all the vigilance of the besieging army, or his nets, which he had spread in the river, while the messenger of the besieged was cleaving the air? Many persons have a mania for pigeons, building towns for them on the top of their roofs, and taking a pleasure in relating the pedigree and noble origin of each. Of this there is an ancient instance which is very remarkable. Lucius Axius, a Roman of the equestrian order, shortly before the civil war of Pompey, sold a single pair for four hundred denarii, so Marcus Varro tells us. Countries even have gained renown for their pigeons. It is thought that those of Campania attain the largest size. End of Book 7, Chapter 18book seven chapter nineteen of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone different modes of flight and progression in birds mentioning the flight of the pigeon leads me to consider that of other birds all other animals have one determinate mode of progression which in every kind is always the same Birds alone have two modes of moving, on the ground and in the air. Some of them walk, such as the crow, for instance. Some hop, as the sparrow and the blackbird. Some run, as the partridge and the wood hen. While others throw one foot before the other, like the stork and the crane. Then again, in their flight, some birds expand their wings, and poising themselves in the air, only move them from time to time. Others move them more frequently, but then only at the extremities, while others expand them so as to expose the whole of the side. On the other hand, some fly with the greater part of the wings kept close to the side, and some, after striking the air once, others twice, make their way through it, as though pressing upon it enclosed beneath their wings. Other birds dart aloft in a vertical direction, others horizontally, and others come falling straight downwards. You would almost think that some had been hurled upwards with a violent effort, and that others had fallen straight down from aloft, while others still are seen to spring forward in their flight. Ducks alone, and the other birds of that kind, in an instant raise themselves aloft, taking a spring from the spot where they stand straight upwards towards the heavens, and this they can do directly from the water. They are the only birds that can make their escape from the pitfalls which we employ for the capture of wild beasts. The vulture and the heavier wild birds can only fly after taking a run, or else by commencing their flight from an elevated spot. They use the tail by way of rudder, there are some birds that are able to see all around them. Others have to turn the neck to do so. Some of them eat what they have seized, holding it in their feet. Many, as they fly, utter some cry, while others are always silent. Some fly with the breast half upright, others with it held downwards. Others fly obliquely or sideways, 
and others follow the direction of the bill. The fact is, that if we were to see several kinds at the same moment, we should not suppose that they were adapted to the same element. Those birds which are known as apodes, footnote, without feet, end of footnote, fly the most of all, because they are deprived of the use of their feet. They are a species of swallow which build their nests in the rocks, and are the same birds that are to be seen everywhere at sea. However far a ship may go, however long its voyage, and however great the distance from land, the apodes never cease to hover around it. Other birds settle and rest, but these know no repose save in the nest. They are always either on the wing or asleep. End of Book 7, Chapter 19book seven chapter twenty of the boys and girls Pliny, volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the boys and girls Pliny, volume four by Pliny the elder chapter twenty strange and fabulous birds the instincts of birds are no less varied in relation to their food. The Capramalgus, or goat milker, is the name of a bird which is, to all appearance, a large blackbird. It thieves by night, as it cannot see during the day. It enters the folds of the shepherd, and makes straight for the udder of a she-goat to suck the milk. Through the injury thus inflicted, the udder shrivels away, and the goat that has been thus deprived of its milk is afflicted is afflicted with incipient blindness. Platea, or spoonbill, is the name of another, which pounces upon other birds when they have dived into the sea, and, seizing the head with its bill, makes them let go of their prey. The bird will swallow and fill itself with shellfish, shells and all and after the natural heat of its crop has softened to them, it will bring them up again, pick out the shells from the rest, and choose the parts that are fit for food. The farmyard fowls have a certain notion of religion. Upon laying an egg, they shudder all over, and then shake their feathers, after which they turn round and purify themselves, or else hollow themselves and their eggs with some stock or other. The cardulus, which is the very smallest bird of any, will do what it is bid, not only with the voice, but with the feet as well, and with the beak, which serves it instead of hands. There is one small bird, found in the territory of Arelay, that imitates the lowing of oxen, from which circumstance it has received the name Taurus. Another, called the Anthus, imitates the neighing of the horse upon being driven from the pasture by the approach of the horses it will mimic their voices taking this method of revenging itself but remarkable as it may seem there are some birds that can imitate the human voice the parrot for instance can even converse india sends us this bird which it calls by the name cetaces the body is green all over, except a ring of red around its neck. It will formally salute an emperor, and pronounce the words it has heard spoken. It is rendered especially frolicsome under the influence of wine. Its head is as hard as its beak, and this, when it is being taught to talk, is beaten with a rod of iron for otherwise it is quite insensible to blows. When it lights on the ground, it falls upon its feet, and by resting upon it makes itself all the lighter for its feet, which are naturally weak. The magpie is much less famous for its talking qualities than the parrot, because it does not come from a distance, and yet it can speak with much more distinctness. These birds love to hear words spoken which they can utter. And not only do they learn them, but are pleased at the task, 
as they can con them over to themselves with the greatest care and attention, make no secret of the interest they feel. It is a well-known fact that a magpie has died before now when it found itself mastered by a difficult word that it could not pronounce. Their memory, however, will fail them if they do not from time to time hear the same word repeated. And while they are trying to recollect it, they will show the most extravagant joy if they happen to hear it. Their appearance, although there is nothing remarkable about it, is by no means plain, but they have quite enough in the way of attraction in their singular ability to imitate human speech. Only that kind of pie which feeds upon acorns can be taught to speak, and among these, those which have five toes on each foot can be taught with the greatest facility, but even in their case, only during the first two years of their life. The magpie has a broad tongue, as do all the birds that can imitate the human voice, although some individuals of almost every kind have the faculty of doing so. Acropina, the wife of Claudius Caesar, had a thrush that could imitate human speech, a thing that was never known before. At the moment that I am writing this, the young Caesars have a starling and some nightingales that are being taught to talk in Greek and Latin, besides which they are studying the task the whole day, continually repeating the new words they have learnt and giving utterance to phrases of considerable length. Birds are taught to talk in a retired spot where no other voice can be heard so as to interfere with their lesson. A person sits by them and continually repeats the words he wishes them to learn, while at the same time he encourages them by giving them food. Let us do justice to the raven, whose merits have been attested not only by the kindlier sentiments of the Roman people, but also by the strong expression of their indignation. In the reign of Tiberius, one of a brood of ravens that had bred on the top of the temple of Castor happened to fly into a shoemaker's shop that stood opposite, upon which, from a feeling of religious veneration, it was looked upon as doubly recommended by the owner of the place. The bird, having been taught to speak at an early age, used every morning to fly to the roster which looked toward the forum. Here, addressing each by his name, it would salute Tiberius, and then the Caesars, Germanicus, and Drusus, after which it would proceed to greet the Roman populace as they passed, and then return to the shop. For several years it was remarkable for the consistency of its attendance. The owner of another shoemaker's shop, the owner of another shoemaker's shop in the neighborhood, in a sudden fit of anger, killed the bird, enraged as he would have had it appear, because it had soiled some shoes of his. Upon this, such rage was manifested by the multitude that he was at once driven from that part of the city and soon after put to death. The funeral, too, of the bird was celebrated with almost endless obsequies. The body was placed upon a litter carried upon the shoulder of two Ethiopians, preceded by a piper, and borne to the pile with garlands of every size and description. The pile was erected to the right-hand side of the Apian Way, at the second milestone from the city, in the field generally known as the Field of Ridiculous. Thus did the rare talent of the bird appear a sufficient ground to enter the Roman people for honoring it with the funeral obsequies, as well as for inflicting punishment on a Roman citizen. No such crowds ever escorted the funeral of any one out of the whole number of its distinguished men. At the present day, there is in the city of Rome a crow, which belongs to a Roman of equestrian rank, and was brought from Baetica. It is remarkable for its color, which is the deepest black, and is able to pronounce several connected words while repeatedly learning fresh ones. Recently, too, there has been a story told about Craterus of Erezina in Asia, who was in the remarkable habit of hunting with the assistance of ravens and used to carry them in the woods, perched in the tuft of his helmet and on his shoulders. The birds used to keep on the watch for game and raise it, and by training he had brought this art to such a pitch of perfection that even the wild ravens would attend him in a similar manner when he went out. 
some authors have thought the following circumstance deserving of remembrance a crow that was thirsty was seen heaping stones into the urn on a monument in which there was some rain-water which it could not reach by thus accumulating the stones it raised the level of the water till it came within its reach i must not pass by the birds of diomedes in silence cuba calls them hatolate and says that they have teeth and eyes of a fiery colour while the rest of its body is white they always have two chiefs the one to lead the main body and the other to take charge of the rear they evacuate holes with their bills and then cover them with hurdles which they then cover again with the earth that has thus been thrown up in these places they hatch their young each of these holes has two outlets one of them looking toward the east by which they go forth to feed returning by the one which looks toward the west in one only spot throughout the whole earth are these birds to be seen in an island which is famous for the tomb and shrine of diomedes lying over against the coast of apulia they bear a strong resemblance to the coot while strangers who are barbarians arrive on that island they pursue them with loud and clamorous cries and only show courtesy to greeks by birth seeming thereby with a wonderful discernment to pay respect to them as fellow countrymen of diomedes every day they fill their throats and cover their feathers with water and so wash and purify the temple there from this circumstance arises the fable that the companions of diomedes were metamorphosed into these birds we ought not to omit while we are speaking of instincts that among birds the swallow is quite incapable of being taught and among land animals the mouse well on the other hand the elephant does what it is ordered the elephant submits to a yoke and the sea calf on many kinds of fishes are capable of being tame birds drink by suction those who have a long neck taking their drink in a succession of breaths and throwing the head back as though they were pouring water down the throat the porphyrio is the only bird that seems to bite at the water as it drinks the same bird has other peculiarities of its own for it will every now and then dip its food in the water and then lift it with its foot to its bill using it as a hand those that are the most esteemed are found in comangine they have beaks and very long red legs all the heavy birds are frugivorous while those of a higher flight feed upon flesh only among the aquatic birds the divers are in the habit of devouring what other birds have disgorged the pelican is similar in appearance to the swan and nobody would imagine there is any difference between them were it not for the fact that under the throat there is some sort of second crop in this the ever insatiate animal throws everything away till the capacity of this pouch is quite astonished having finished its search for prey it discharges bit by bit what it has thus stowed away and reconveys it in a sort of rummaging process into its real stomach the part of galia that lies nearest to the northern ocean produces this bird we hear of a singular kind of bird in the hercinian forest in germany the feathers of which shine at night like fire the other birds there have nothing remarkable beyond the celebrity which generally attaches to objects situated at a distance during the civil wars that took place at bebriacum beyond the river Petus, the new birds were introduced into italy for by that name they are still known they resemble the thrush in appearance are a little smaller than a pigeon in size and of an agreeable flavour the balearic islands also send us a porphyrio or flamingo as well as the buteo a kind of hawk held in high esteem for the table and the vipio the name given to a small kind of crane i look upon birds as fabulous which are called pegasi and are said to have a horse's head and also the griffins with long ears and a hooked beak the same is my opinion also as to the tragopan many writers however assert that it is larger than the eagle has curved horns on the temples and a plumage of iron colour with the exception of the head which is purple nor do the sirens obtain any better credit with me although dinon the father of clarchus a 
a celebrated writer, asserts that they exist in India, and that they charm men by their song, and, having first lulled them to sleep, tear them to pieces. The person, however, who may think fit to believe in these tales, may probably refuse to believe that dragons licked the ears of Melopodes and bestowed upon him the power of understanding the language of birds, or what Democritus says, when he gives the names of certain birds, by the mixture of whose blood a serpent is produced, the person who eats of which will be able to understand the language of birds, as well as the statements which the same writer makes relative to one bird in particular, known as the Gallerita, or crested lark. Indeed, the science of argury is already much too involved with embarrassing questions without these fanciful reveries. End of chapter 20. Book 7, Chapter 21 of The Boys and Girls Pliny. Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Generous Horse. The Boys and Girls Pliny. Volume 4 by Pliny the Elder. Chapter 21. The Art of Cramming Poultry. Aviaries. The people of Delos were the first to cram poultry, and to originate that abominable mania for devouring fattened birds, larded with the grease of their own bodies. I find in the ancient sumptuary regulations as to banquets, that it was forbidden for the first time by a law of the consul Caius Fenius, eleven years before the Third Punic War, by which it was ordered that no bird should be served at table beyond a single fillet, and that not fattened, an article which has since made its appearance in all the sumptuary laws. A method, however, has been devised of evading it, by feeding poultry upon food that has been soaked in milk. Prepared in this fashion, they are considered still more delicate. Not all pullets are looked upon as equally good for the purposes of fattening, but only those are selected which have a fatty skin about the neck. Then come all the arts and affectations of the kitchen, that the thighs may have a nice plump appearance that the bird may be properly divided down the back, and that poultry may be brought to such a size that a single leg shall fill a whole platter. The Parthians have taught their fashions to our cooks, yet after all, in spite of their refinements and luxury, no article is found to please equally in every part, for in one it is the thigh, and in another the breast that is esteemed. The first person who invented aviaries for the reception of all kinds of birds was Marcus Lanius Strabo, a member of the equestrian order who resided at Brunisium. In his time we thus began to imprison animals to which nature had assigned the heavens as their element. But more remarkable than anything else in this respect is the story of the dish of Clodius Aesophus, the tragic actor, which was violated one hundred thousand sectuses, in which were served up nothing but birds that had been remarkable for their song, or their imitation of the human voice, and he purchased each of them at the price of six thousand sectuses, being induced to this folly by no other pleasure than that he might eat the closest imitators of men never for a moment reflecting that his own immense fortune had been acquired by the advantages of his voice, a parent right worthy of the son whom we have already made mention as swallowing pearls. It would not be easy to decide which of the two was guilty of the greatest baseness unless, indeed, we admit that it was less unseemly to banquet upon the most costly of all the productions of nature 
than to devour tongues which had given utterance to the language of man. End of chapter 21 Book 7, Chapter 22 of The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Generous Horse The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4 Chapter 22 The Peculiarities of Animals the salamander, an animal like a lizard in shape, and with a body starred all over, never comes out except during heavy showers, and disappears the moment it becomes fine. This animal is so intensely cold as to extinguish fire by its contact, in the same way that ice does. It spits forth a milky matter from its mouth, and from whatever part of the human body is touched with this, all the hair falls off, and the part assumes the appearance of leprosy. Man excels most in his sense of touch, and next in that sense of taste. In other respects, he is surpassed by many of the animals. Eagles can see more clearly than any other animals, while vultures have the better smell, moles hear more distinctly than others, although buried in the earth, so dense and sluggish an element as it is, and though every sound has a tendency upwards, they can hear the words that are spoken, and it is said that if you talk about them, they will take flight immediately. Among men, a person who has not enjoyed the sense of hearing in its infancy is deprived of the powers of speech as well. Among marine animals, it is not probable that oysters enjoy the sense of hearing, but it is said that the instant a noise is made, the sullen will will sink to the bottom. For this reason, silence is observed by persons while fishing at sea. Fish have neither organs of hearing nor the exterior orifice, and yet it is quite certain that they do hear, for it is a well-known fact that in some fish ponds they are in the habit of being assembled to be fed by the clapping of the hands. In the fish ponds, too, that belong to the emperor, the fish are in the habit of coming, each kind as it hears its name. So the mullet, the wolfish, the salpa, and the chromis have a very exquisite sense of hearing, and for this reason they frequent shallow water. It is quite manifest that fish have also the sense of smell, for they are not all to be taken by the same bait, and are all seen to smell at it before they seize it. Some, too, that are concealed at the bottom of holes are driven out by the fishermen, and by aid of the smell of salted fish, with this he rubs the entrance of their retreat in the rock, immediately upon which they take flight from the spot, and though they had recognized the dead carcass as though they had recognized the dead carcass of their kind, then they will rise to the surface at the smell of such odors, such, for instance, as roasted sapia and polypus. These baits are placed in the osier kipes used for taking fish. They immediately take to flight upon smelling the bilge water and the ship's hold and especially upon scenting the blood of fish. The polypus cannot possibly be torn away from the rock to which it clings, but apply the herb canilla, and the instant it smells it, the fish quits its hold. Purples are also taken by means of fetid substances. As to the other kinds of animals, who is there that can feel any doubt that they possess the sense of smell? Serpents are driven away by the smell of hearts' horns, and ants are killed by the odors of organium, lime, and sulfur. Gnats are attracted by acids, but not by anything sweet. All animals have the sense of touch, even those who have no other sense. In the oyster and the worm, this sense is found. 
I am strongly inclined to believe, too, that the sense of taste exists in all animals, for why else should one seek one kind of food and another another? In this it is to be seen the wondrous power of nature, the framer of all things. Some animals seize their prey with their teeth, others with their claws. Some tear it to pieces with their hooked beak, others that have a broad bill wobble in their food, while others with a sharp nib work holes into it. Others suck at their food, lick it, sup in it, chew it, or bolt it whole. And no less a diversity is there in the uses that they make with their feet for the purpose of carrying, tearing asunder, holding, squeezing, suspending their bodies, or incessantly scratching the ground. Serpents will feed on eggs, and the address displayed by the dragon is quite remarkable, for it will either swallow the egg whole, if the jaws will allow it, and roll over and over so as to break it within, and then, by coughing, eject the shells, or else, if it is too young to be able to do so, it will gradually encircle the egg with its coils, and hold it so tight as to break it at the end, just, in fact, as though the piece had been cut with a knife. Then, holding the remaining part in its folds, it will suck the contents. Scorpions live in the earth. Serpents, when the, an opportunity presents itself, show an especial liking for wine, although in other aspects they need but very little drink. These animals, when kept shut up, require but little aliment, hardly any at all, in fact. The same is the case also with spiders, which at other times live by suction. No venomous animal will die of hunger or thirst. The sphingium and the satyr stow away food in the pouches of their cheeks, after which they will take it out piece by piece with their hands and eat it. And thus they do for a day or an hour, what an ant usually does for the whole year. The only animal with toes upon the feet that feeds upon the grass is the hare, and he will eat corn as well, while the solid-hoofed animals and the swine among the cloven-footed ones will eat all kinds of food, as well as the roots. To roll over and over is the peculiarity of the animals with a solid hoof. All those which have serrated teeth are carnivorous. Bears live also upon corn, leaves, grapes, fruit, bees, crabs, and ants. Wolves will eat earth even when they are famishing. Cattle grow fat by drinking, hence salt agrees with them well. All animals ruminate lying in preference to standing, and more in winter than in summer. The Pontic mouse also ruminates in a similar matter. In drinking, these animals which have serrated or canine teeth lap, and common mice do the same, although they belong in another class. Those which have the teeth continuous, horses and oxen, for instance, sup. Bears do neither one or the other, but they seem to bite the water and so devour it. In Africa, the greater part of the wild beasts do not drink in summer, through the want of rain. The mice of Libya, when caught, will die if they drink. The ever-thirsting plains of Africa produce the oryx, an animal which, in consequence of the nature of its native locality, never drinks, and which, in a remarkable manner, affords a remedy against drought, for Gaetulian bandits, by its aid, fortify themselves against thirst, by finding in its body certain vesticles filled with the most wholesome liquid, in this same Africa, also, the pards conceal themselves in the thick foliage of the trees, and then spring down from the branches on any creature that may happen to be passing by, thus occupying what are ordinarily the haunts of the birds. With what silent stealthiness, with what light steps do cats creep towards a bird? How slyly they will sit and watch, and then dart out upon a mouse. End of chapter 22 End of book 7 Book 8, chapter 1 of The Boys and Girls Pliny, volume 4 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Generous Horse. The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4, by Pliny the Elder. Chapter 1. The Extreme Smallness of Insects. We shall now proceed to a description of insects, a subject replete with endless difficulties. Insects are numerous and form many species, and their mode of life is that of the terrestrial animals and the birds. Some, like bees, are furnished with wings. Others are divided into those kinds which have wings and those which are without them, such as ants while others, again, are destitute of both wings and feet. All these animals have been properly called insects, from the incisures or divisions which separate the body, sometimes at the neck, sometimes at the corset, and so divided into members or segments, only united to each other by a slender tube. In some insects, however, this division is not complete and it is surrounded by wrinkled folds and the flexible vertebrae of the creature, whether situate at the abdomen or whether only at the upper part of the body, are protected by layers overlapping each other. Indeed, in no one of her works has nature more fully displayed her exhaustless ingenuity. In large animals, on the other hand, or at all events in the very largest of them, she has found her task easy and her materials ready and pliable, but in these minute creatures, so nearly akin as they are to non-entity, how surpassing the intelligence, how vast the resources, how ineffable to perfection which she has displayed. Where is it that she has united so many senses as in the gnat? not to speak of creatures that might be mentioned of a still smaller size. Where, I say, has she found the place to put the organs of sight? Where has she centered the sense of taste? Where has she inserted the power of smell? And where, too, has she implanted that sharp, shrill voice of the creature, so utterly disproportioned to the smallness of its body, with that astonishing subtlety? She has united the wings to the trunk, elongated the joints of the legs, framed that long craving concavity for a belly, and then inflamed the animal with an insatiate thirst for blood, that of man especially. What ingenuity has she displayed in providing it with a sting so well adapted for piercing the skin? And then, too, just as she had had the most extensive field for the exercise of her skill, although the weapon is so minute that it can hardly be seen, she has formed it with a twofold mechanism, providing it with a point for the purpose of piercing, and at the same moment making it hollow, to adapt it for suction. What teeth, too, has she inserted into the Toretto, to adapt it for piercing even oak, with a sound which fully attests or destructive power, while at the same time she has made wood its principal nutriment. We willingly yield our admiration to the shoulders of the elephant as they support the turret, to the stalwart neck of the bull, and the might with which it hurls aloft whatever comes its way, to the onslaught of the tiger or to the mane of the lion, while at the same time nature has nowhere to be seen the greater perfection than in the very smallest of her works. For this reason, then, I must beg of my readers, notwithstanding the contempt they feel for many of these objects, not to feel a similar disdain for the information I am about to give relative thereto, seeing that, in the study of nature, there are none of her works that are unworthy of our consideration. End of chapter 1 Book 8, Chapter 2 of The Boys and Girls, Pliny, Volume 4 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Boys and Girls, Pliny, Volume 4, by Pliny the Elder, Chapter 2. Whether Insects Breathe and Whether They Have Blood. Many authors deny that insects breathe, upon the ground that in their viscera there is no respiratory organ to be found. They assert that insects have the same kind of life as plants and trees, there being a very great difference between respiring and merely having life. On similar grounds also, they assert that insects have no blood, a thing which cannot exist, they say, in any animal that is destitute of heart and liver, just as, according to them, those creatures cannot breathe which have no lungs. Upon these points, however, a vast number of questions will naturally arise, for the same writers do not hesitate to deny that these creatures are destitute also of voice, and this, notwithstanding the humming of bees, the chirping of grasshoppers, and the sounds emitted by numerous other insects, which will be considered in their respective places. For my part, whenever I have considered the subject, I have ever felt persuaded that there is nothing impossible to nature, nor do I see why creatures should be less able to live and yet not inhale than to respire without being possessed of viscera, a doctrine which I have already maintained when speaking of the marine animals, and that, notwithstanding the density and the vast depth of the water, which would appear to impede all breathing. But what person could very easily believe that there can be any creatures that fly to and fro and live in the very midst of the element of respiration, while at the same time they themselves are devoid of that respiration, that they can be possessed of the requisite instincts for nourishment, working and making provision even for time to come, in the enjoyment too of the powers of hearing, smelling and tasting, as well as those other precious gifts of nature, address, courage and skilfulness. That these creatures have no blood I am ready to admit, just as all the terrestrial animals are not possessed of it, but they have something similar by way of equivalent. Insects, so far as I find myself able to ascertain, seem to have neither sinews, bones, spines, cartilages, fat, nor flesh, nor yet so much as a frail shell like some of the marine animals, nor even anything that can with any propriety be termed skin. But they have a body which is of a kind of intermediate nature between all these, of an arid substance, softer than muscle, and, in other respects, of a nature that may, in strictness, be rather pronounced yielding than hard. Such, then, is all that they are, and nothing more. In the inside of their bodies there is nothing, except in a few which have an intestine arranged in folds. Hence, even when cut asunder, they are remarkable for their tenacity of life and the palpitations which are to be seen in each of their parts. For every portion of them is possessed of its own vital principle, which is centred in no limb in particular, but in every part of the body. Least of all, however, in the head, which alone is subject to no movements unless torn off together with the corselet. No kind of animal has more feet than the insects have, and those which have the most live the longest when cut asunder, as we see in the case of the scolopendra. They have eyes, as well as the senses of touch and taste. Some of them have also the sense of smelling, and a few that of hearing. End of chapter. Recording by Rachel May Ferryman. Book 8, Chapter 3 of The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4, by Pliny the Elder. Chapter 3. Bees. But among them all, the first rank, and our special admiration, ought in justice to be accorded to bees, which alone, of all the insects, appear to have been created for the benefit of man. They extract honey and collect it, a juicy substance remarkable for its extreme sweetness, lightness and wholesomeness. They form their combs and collect wax, an article that is useful for a thousand purposes of life. 
they are patient of fatigue, toil at their labours, form themselves into political communities, hold councils together in private, elect chiefs in common, and a thing that is the most remarkable of all, have their own code of morals. In addition to this, being as they are neither tame nor wild, so all-powerful is nature that, from a creature so minute as to be nothing more hardly than the shadow of an animal, she has created a marvel beyond all comparison. What muscular power, what exertion of strength are we to put in comparison with such vast energy and industry as theirs? What display of human genius, in a word, shall we compare with the reasoning powers manifested by them? In this they have, at all events, the advantage of us. They know of nothing but what is for the common benefit of all. Away then with all questions whether they breathe or no, and let us be ready to agree on the question of their blood. And now let us form some idea of the instinct they display. Bees keep within the hive during the winter, for whence are they to derive the strength requisite to withstand frosts and snows and the northern blasts? The same, in fact, is done by all insects, but not to so late a period, as those which conceal themselves in the walls of our houses are much sooner sensible of the returning warmth. With reference to bees, either seasons and climates have considerably changed, or else former writers have been greatly mistaken. They retire for the winter at the setting of the Virgilier, and remain shut up till after the rising of that constellation, well past the beginning of spring. They do not come forth to ply their labours until the bean blossoms, but then not a day do they lose in inactivity while the weather is favourable for their pursuits. First of all, they set about constructing their combs and forming the wax, or, in other words, making their dwellings and cells. After this, they produce their eggs and then make honey and wax from flowers and extract bee glue from the tears of those trees which distill glutinous substances, the juices, gums, and resins namely of the willow, the elm, and the reed. With these substances, as well as others of a more bitter nature, they first line the whole inside of the hive, as a sort of protection against the greedy propensities of other small insects, as they are well aware that they are about to form that which will prove an object of attraction to them. Having done this, they employ similar substances in narrowing the entrance to the hive, if otherwise too wide. The bees also form collections of bee bread to serve as the food of the bees while they are at work, and is often found stowed away in the cavities of the cells, being of a bitter flavour. It is produced from the spring dews and the gummy juices of trees, being less abundant while the southwest wind is blowing, and blackened by the prevalence of a south wind. Sometimes it is of a reddish colour and becomes improved by the northeast wind. It is found in the greatest abundance upon the nut trees in Greece. Bees form wax from the blossoms of almost all trees and plants. Where olives are in the greatest abundance, the swarms of bees are the most numerous. Bees are not injurious to fruit of any kind. They will never settle on a dead flower, much less a dead carcass. They pursue their labours within three score paces of their hives, and when the flowers in their vicinity are exhausted, they send out scouts from time to time to discover places for forage at a greater distance. When overtaken by night in their expeditions, they watch till the morning, lying on their backs in order to protect their wings from the action of the dew. It is not surprising that there have been persons who have made bees their exclusive study, Aristomachus of Soli, for instance, who for a period of 58 years did nothing else. Philiscus of Tharsos, also, surnamed Agrius, who passed his life in desert spots, tending swarms of bees. Both of these have written works on this subject. End of chapter. Recording by Rachel May Ferryman. Book 8, Chapter 4 of The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4 by Pliny the Elder. Chapter 4 The Mode in Which Bees Work. The manner in which bees carry on their work is as follows. 
In the daytime, a guard is stationed at the entrance of the hive, like the sentries in a camp. At night, they take their rest, until one of them awakes the others in the morning with a humming noise, repeated twice or thrice, just as though it were sounding a trumpet. They then take their flight in a body, if the day is likely to turn out fine, for they have the gift of foreknowing wind and rain, and in such case will keep close within their dwellings. On the other hand, in fine weather the swarm issues forth and at once applies itself to its work, some loading their legs from the flowers, while others fill their mouths with water and charge the downy surface of their bodies with drops of liquid. Those among them that are young go forth to their labours and collect the materials already mentioned, while those that are more aged stay within the hives and work. The bees whose business it is to carry the flowers use their forefeet to load their thighs, which nature has made rough for the purpose, and with their trunks load their forefeet. Bending beneath their load, they then return to the hive, where there are three or four bees ready to receive them and aid in discharging their burdens. For, within the hive as well, they have their allotted duties to perform. Some are engaged in building, others in smoothing the combs, while others again are occupied in passing the materials and others in preparing food from the provision which has been brought. That there may be no unequal division, either in their labour, their food or the distribution of their time, they do not even feed separately. Commencing at the vaulted roof of the hive, they begin the construction of their cells, and, just as we do in the manufacture of a web, they construct their cells from top to bottom, taking care to leave two passages around each compartment for the entrance of some and the exit of others. The combs, which are fastened to the hive in the upper part, and in a slight degree also at the sides, adhere to each other and are thus suspended altogether. They do not touch the floor of the hive and are either angular or round according to its shape. Sometimes, in fact, they are both angular and round at once, when two swarms are living in unison but have dissimilar modes of operation. They prop up the combs that are likely to fall by means of arched pillars at intervals springing from the floor so as to leave them a passage for the purpose of effecting repairs. The first three ranks of their cells are generally left empty when constructed, and the last ones, especially, are filled with honey, hence the combs are always taken out at the back of the hive. The bees that are employed in carrying look out for a favourable breeze, and if a gale should happen to spring up, they poise themselves in the air with little stones by way of ballast. Some writers say that they place them upon their shoulders. When the wind is contrary, they fly close to the ground, taking care, however, to keep clear of the brambles. It is wonderful what strict watch is kept upon their work. All instances of idleness are carefully remarked. The offenders are chastised, and, on a repetition of the fault, punished with death. Their sense of cleanliness, too, is quite extraordinary. Everything is removed that might be in the way, and the rubbish and waste bits made by those that are at work within is all collected into one spot. And on stormy days, when they are obliged to cease their ordinary labours, they employ themselves in carrying it out. Towards evening, the buzzing in the hive becomes gradually less and less, until at last one of their number is to be seen flying about the hive with the same loud humming noise with which they were aroused in the morning, thereby giving the signal, as it were, to retire to rest. In this, too, they imitate the usage of the camp. The moment the signal is heard, all is silent. They first construct the dwellings of the commonalty, then those of the king bee. If they have reason to expect an abundant season, they add abodes also for the drones. These are cells of a smaller size, though the drones themselves are larger than the bees. The drones have no sting, and would seem to be a kind of imperfect bee, formed the very last of all, a late and tardy offspring, and doomed, in a measure, to be the slaves of the genuine bees. The others exercise over them a rigorous authority, compel them to take the foremost rank in their labours, and if they show any sluggishness, punish them without mercy. When the honey is beginning to come to maturity, the bees drive away the drones, and setting upon each other in great numbers, put them all to death. It is only in the spring that the drones are ever to be seen. If you deprive a drone of its wings, and then replace it in the hive, it will pull off the wings of the other drones. 
In the lower part of the hive, they construct for their future sovereign a palatial abode, spacious and grand, separated from the rest, and surmounted by a sort of dome. If this prominence should happen to be flattened, all hopes of progeny are lost. All the cells are hexagonal. No part of this work is done at any stated time, as the bees seize every opportunity for the performance of their task when the days are fine. In one or two days at most, they fill their cells with honey. The honey is always best in those countries where it is to be found deposited in the calyx of the most exquisite flowers, such, for instance, as the districts of Hymetus in Attica and Hybla in Sicily, and after them the island of Calydna. At first, honey is thin, like water, after which it effervesces for some days, and purifies itself like must. On the twentieth day it begins to thicken, and soon after becomes covered with a thin membrane which gradually increases through the scum which is thrown up by the heat. The honey of the very finest flavour and the least tainted by the leaves of trees is that gathered from the foliage of the oak and the linden, and from reeds. In some countries we find the honeycomb remarkable for the goodness of the wax, as in Sicily and the country of the Piligni. In other places the honey itself is found in greater abundance, as in Crete, Cyprus, and Africa. And in others again the comb is remarkable for its size. In Germany a comb has been known to be as much as eight feet in length. In taking the combs, the greatest care is always requisite, for the bees become desperate when stinted for food, and either pine to death or wing their flight to other places. On the other hand, overabundance will entail idleness, and they will feed upon the honey, and not the bee bread. The most careful breeders take care to leave the bees a fifteenth part of this gathering. The crop of honey is most abundant if gathered at full moon, and is richest when the weather is fine. The summer honey is the most esteemed of all, from the fact of its being made when the weather is driest. It is best when made from thyme, it is then of a golden colour, and of a most delicious flavour. Thyme honey does not coagulate, and on being touched will draw out into thin viscous threads, the proof of its heaviness. When honey shows no tenacity, and the drops immediately part from one another, it is looked upon as a sign of its worthlessness. End of chapter. Recording by Rachel May Ferryman. Book 8, Chapter 5 of The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4 by Pliny the Elder. Chapter 5 The Mode of Government of the Bees. Let a man employ himself, forsooth, in the inquiry whether there has been only one Hercules, how many Bacchuses there have been, and all the other questions which are buried deep in the mould of antiquity. Here behold a tiny object, one to be met with at most of our country retreats, and numbers of which are always at hand, and yet, after all, it is not agreed among authors whether or not the king is the only one among them that is provided with no sting and is possessed of no other arms than those afforded him by his majestic office, or whether nature has granted him a sting, and has only denied him the power of making use of it, it being a well-known fact that the ruling bee never does use a sting. The obedience which his subjects manifest in his presence is quite surprising. When he goes forth, the whole swarm attends him, throngs about him, surrounds him, protects him, and will not allow him to be seen. At other times, when the swarm is at work within, the king is seen to visit the works, and appears to be giving his encouragements, being himself the only one that is exempt from work. Around him are certain other bees which act as bodyguards and lictors, the careful guardians of his authority. The king never quits the hive except when the swarm is about to depart, a thing which may be known a long time beforehand, as for some days a peculiar buzzing noise is to be heard within which denotes that the bees are waiting for a favourable day and making all due preparations for their departure. On such an occasion, if care is taken to deprive the king of one of his wings, the swarm will not fly away. When they are on the wing, everyone is anxious to be near him, 
and takes a pleasure in being seen in the performance of its duty. When he is weary, they support him on their shoulders, and when he is quite tired, they carry him outright. If one of them falls in the rear from weariness or happens to go astray, it is able to follow the others by the aid of its acuteness of smell. Wherever the king bee happens to settle, that becomes the encampment of all. Happy omens are sometimes afforded by the swarming of bees, clustering as they do, like a bunch of grapes, upon houses or temples, presages often of great events. Bees settled upon the lips of Plato when still an infant, announcing thereby the sweetness of that persuasive eloquence for which he was so noted. Bees settled in the camp of the chieftain Drusus when he gained the brilliant victory at Arbolo, a proof that the conjectures of soothsayers are not by any means infallible, for they consider this always of evil augury. When their leader is withheld from them, the swarm can always be detained. When lost, it will disperse and take its departure to find other kings. Without a king, they cannot exist. If food fail the inhabitants of any particular hive, the swarm makes a concerted attack upon a neighbouring one, with the view of plundering it. The swarm attacked at once ranges itself in battle array, and if the beekeeper should happen to be present, that side which perceives itself favoured by him will refrain from attacking him. They often fight for other reasons, and the two generals are to be seen drawing up their ranks in battle array against their opponents. The battle is immediately ended by throwing dust among them or raising a smoke, and if milk or honey mixed with water is placed before them, they speedily become reconciled. End of chapter. Recording by Rachel May Ferryman. Book 8, Chapter 6 of The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gauntz. The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4 by Pliny the Elder. Chapter 6 Wasps and Hornets. Wasps build their nests of mud in lofty places and make wax. Hornets, on the other hand, build in holes or in the hollows of trees. With these two kinds, the cells are also hexagonal, but in other respects, though made of the bark of trees, they strongly resemble the substance of a spider's web. Their young are found at irregular intervals and are of unshapely appearance. While one is able to fly, another is still a mere pupa, and a third only in the maggot state. The wasp, which is known as the ichneumon, a smaller kind than the others, kills one kind of spider in particular, known as the phalangium, after which it carries the body to its nest, covers it over with a sort of gluey substance, and then sits and hatches from its young. In addition to this, they are all of them carnivorous, while bees will touch no animal substance whatever. Wasps particularly pursue the larger flies, and after catching them, cut off the head and carry away the remaining portion of the body. Wild hornets live in the holes of trees, and in winter, like other insects, keep themselves concealed. Their life does not exceed two years in length. Not unfrequently their sting is productive of an attack of fever, and there are authors who say that thrice nine stings will suffice to kill a man. In spring they build their nests, generally with four entrances, and here the working hornets are produced. After these have been hatched, they form other nests of larger size. These races, too, have their drones. Neither hornets nor wasps have a king, nor do they ever congregate in swarms. End of chapter 6 Book 8, Chapter 7 of The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gauntz the Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4, by Pliny the Elder. Chapter 7. The Silkworm. Another class of insects spring from a grub of larger size, with two horns of very peculiar appearance. The larva becomes a caterpillar, after which it assumes the state in which it is known as Bombylus, then that called Nicetalus, and in six months it becomes a silkworm. These insects weave webs similar to those of the spider, the material of which is used for making the more costly and luxurious garments of ladies, known as bombycina. Pamphile, a woman of Kos, the daughter of Plataea, 
was the first woman who discovered the art of unraveling these webs and spinning a tissue therefrom. The silkworm is said to be a native of the Isle of Kos, where the vapors of the earth give new life to the flowers of the cypress, the terebinth, the ash, and the oak, which have been beaten down by the showers. At first they assume the appearance of small butterflies with naked bodies, but soon after, being unable to endure the cold, they throw out bristly hairs and assume quite a thick coat against the winter, rubbing off the down that covers the leaves by the aid of the roughness of their feet. This they compress into balls by carding it with their claws, and then draw it out and hang it between the branches of the trees, making it fine by combing it out. Last of all, they take and roll it around their body, thus forming a nest in which they are enveloped. In this state they are taken, after which they are placed in earthen vessels in a warm place and fed upon bran. A peculiar sort of down soon shoots forth upon the body, on being clothed with which they are set to work upon another task. The cocoons which they have begun to form are rendered soft and pliable by the aid of water, and are then drawn out into threads by means of a spindle made of a reed. Even men have not felt ashamed to make use of garments formed of this material, in consequence of their extreme lightness in summer, for so greatly have manners degenerated in our day that, so far from wearing a cuirass, a thin garment is found to be too heavy. End of chapter 7book eight chapter eight of the boys and girls pliny volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the boys and girls pliny volume four by pliny the elder Chapter 8 Spiders It is by no means an absurdity to append to the silkworm an account of the spider, creature worthy of our special admiration. The flanageum is of a small size, with body spotted and running to a point. Their bite is venomous, and they leap as they move from place to place. Another kind is black, with four legs remarkable for their length. They have all of them three joints in the legs. The smaller kind of wolf spider does not make a web, but the larger ones make holes in the earth and spread their nets at the narrow entrance. A third kind is remarkable for the skill which it displays in its operations. These spin a large web, the creature having in itself a certain faculty of secreting a peculiar sort of woolly substance. How steadily does it work of its claws, how beautifully rounded, and how equal are the threads as it forms its web, while it employs the weight of its body as an equipoise. It begins at the middle to weave its web, and then extends it by adding the threads in rings around, like a warp upon the woof, forming the meshes at equal intervals but continually enlarging them as the web increases in breadth. It finally unites them all by an indissolvable knot. With what wondrous art does it conceal the snares that lie in wait for its prey in its checkered nettings? How loose is the body of the web as it yields to the blasts? And how readily does it catch all objects which come in its way? You would fancy that it had left, quite exhausted, the thumbs of the upper portion of its net unfinished, where they are spread across, for with the greatest difficulty can they be perceived. And yet the moment that an object touches them, like the lines of the hunter's net, they throw it into the body of the web. With what architectural skill, too, is its hole arched over, and how well defended by a nap of extra thickness against the cold. How carefully it retires into a corner, and appears intent upon something else, all the while keeping so carefully shut up from view that it is impossible to perceive whether there is anything within or not. And then how extraordinary the strength of the web! When is the wind ever known to break it, or what accumulation of dust is able to weigh it down? The spider often spreads its web right across between two trees, 
the thread extending from the very top of the tree to the ground, while the insect springs up again in an instant from the earth, and travels aloft by the self-same thread, thus mounting at the same moment and spinning its threads. When its prey falls into its net, how on the alert it is, and with what readiness it runs to seize it, even though it should be adhering to the very edge of its web, the insect always runs instantly to the middle, where it can most effectually shake the web, and so successfully entangle its prey. When the web is torn, the spider immediately sets about repairing it, and that so neatly that nothing like patching can ever be seen. The spider lies in wait even for the young of the lizard, and after enveloping the head of the animal, bites its lips, a sight by no means unworthy the amphitheatre itself, when it is one's good fortune to witness it. Presages also are drawn from the spider, for when a river is about to swell, it will suspend its web higher than usual. As these insects spin not in calm weather, but when it is cloudy, a great number of cobwebs is a sure sign of showery weather. It is generally supposed that the female spider spins while the male lies in wait for prey, thus making an equal division of their duties. End of chapter 8 Book 8, Chapter 9 of The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 4, by Pliny the Elder. Chapter 9. Locusts. Locusts lay their eggs in large masses in the autumn, in holes which they form in the ground. These eggs remain underground throughout the winter, and in the ensuing year at the close of spring, small locusts issue from them of a black colour. A wet spring destroys their eggs, while, if it is dry, they multiply in great abundance. Locusts are produced only in champagne places, that are full of chinks and crannies. In India it is said that they attain the length of three feet, and that the people dry their legs and thighs and use them for sores. Sometimes the winds carry off these creatures in vast swarms upon which they fall into the sea or standing waters and perish. Some authors have stated that they are unable to fly during the night in consequence of the cold, being ignorant of the fact that they travel over lengthened tracts of sea for many days together, a thing the more to be wondered at as they have to endure hunger all the time as well. For this is it which causes them to be thus seeking pastures in other lands. Such a visitation is looked upon as a plague inflicted by the anger of the gods, for as they fly they appear to be larger than they really are, while they make such a loud noise of their wings that they might be readily supposed to be winged creatures of quite another species. Their numbers, too, are so vast that they quite darken the sun, while the people below are anxiously following them with the eye, to see if they are about to make a descent, and so cover their lands. After all, they have the requisite energies for their flight, and as though it had been but a trifling matter to pass over the seas, they cross immense tracts of country, and cover them in clouds, which bode destruction to the harvests, scorching numerous objects by their very contact, they eat away everything with their teeth, even the very doors of the houses. Those from Africa are the ones which chiefly devastate Italy, and more than once the Roman people have been obliged to have recourse to the Sibylline books to learn what remedies to employ under their existing apprehensions of impending famine. In the territory of Serenaca there is a law which even compels the people to make war three times a year against the locusts, first by crushing their eggs, next by killing the young, 
and last of all by killing those of full growth, and he who fails to do so incurs the penalty of being treated as a deserter. In the island of Lemos also, there is a certain measure fixed by law, which each individual is bound to fill with locusts, which he has killed, and then bring it to the magistrates. They pay great respect to the jackdaw, which flies to meet the locusts, and kills them in great numbers. In Syria, the people are placed under martial law, and compelled to kill them. In so many countries does this dreadful pest prevail. The Parthians look upon them as a choice food, and the grasshopper as well. The voice of the locust appears to proceed from the back part of the head. It is generally believed that in this place, where the shoulders join on to the body, they have, as it were, a kind of teeth, and by grinding these against each other, they produce the harsh noise which they make. About the two equinoxes they are to be heard in the same way, that we hear the chirp of the grasshopper about the summer solstice. In all these kinds of insects, the male is of smaller size than the female. End of chapter 9「Book Eight, Chapter Eight of the Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume Four. This is a Libothox recording. All Libothox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Libothox.org. The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume Four by Pliny the Elder. Chapter 10. Ants. Ants work in common like bees, but while the latter make their food, the former only store it away. If a person compares the burdens which the ants carry with the size of their bodies, he must confess that there is no animal which in proportion is possessed of a greater degree of strength. They carry these burdens with the mouth, or when it is too large to admit of that, they turn their backs to it and push it onwards with their feet, while they use their utmost energies with their shoulders. These insects have a political community among themselves and are possessed of both memory and foresight. They gnaw each grain before they lay it by, for fear lest it should shoot while underground. They divide those grains which are too large for admission at the entrance of their holes, and those which have become soaked by the rain they bring out and dry. They work too by night during the full moon. What ardour they display in their labours! What wondrous carefulness! Because they collect their stores in different quarters, in ignorance of the proceedings of one another, there are certain days set apart for holding a kind of market on which they meet together and take stock. What vast throngs are then to be seen hurrying together, what anxious inquiries appear to be made, and what earnest parleys are going on among them as they meet. We see even the very stones worn away by their footsteps, and roads beaten down by being the scenes of their labours. Let no one fail to see how much can be affected by acidity and application, even in the very humblest of objects. Ants are the only living beings, besides man, that bestow burial on the dead. The horns of an Indian ant, suspended in the temple of Hercules at Ephraim, have been looked upon as quite miraculous for their size. This ant excavates gold from holes in a country in the north of India, the inhabitants of which are known as the Darde. It has the colour of a cat and is in size as large as an Egyptian wolf. This gold, which it extracts in the winter, is taken by the Indians during the heats of summer while the ants are compelled by the excessive warmth to hide themselves in their holes. Still, however, aroused by the scent of the Indians, 
they will sally forth and frequently tear them to pieces. Though the Indians may be provided with the swiftest camels for the purpose of flight, so great is their fleetness, combined with their ferocity and their passion for gold. End of chapter 10 End of The Boys and Girls Pliny Volume 4 by Pliny the Elder